So, Corey, our guest today is an old friend of yours, DT or Dan Max, and uh, I've heard you talk in the past about a nonfiction science book he wrote called The Family That Couldn't Sleep, which is about a family with a genetic condition that makes them vulnerable to a kind of prionic disease that um, makes them insomniacs and eventually kills them. Now, I would, I think for our readers who haven't read the book, maybe you could talk a little bit about why you think the book is great and why you recommend it and what are the special qualities of the book. So I, I think the book is really stellar for a couple of different reasons. It's a kind of mix of genres. I'm a fan of certain kinds of literary fiction. And I think unlike a lot of what's called popular science, this book is actually, this book actually has a pretty serious literary quality. It's incredibly well written. The narrative is very, very strong. It really reads like a novel, a high quality novel, uh, and also detective story, knowing also the detective fiction often isn't extremely high quality. But Dan's a wonderful writer. And just, I actually pay a fair amount of time to his sentences and how he paces the book. And that combination of writing a really good science story in a narrative form is probably its great strength. So has it been compared to In Cold Blood by Truman Capote, which... You pro- it, you probably you're familiar with that, right? Or It hasn't. I think when I think about this book, I think what's sort of hard is that it's in a genre where people often don't think much about really good writing. People just think of a pop science book as sort of taking an idea and making it you know, accessible to the public. And so there's really very little effort of trying to make a book um, kind of a work of art. And I think that's what he's really succeeded in. It's also, I think, a story that's really in the middle this book is about the discovery of the causes of these disease, prions, showing they look like they're actual infectious agents. But there's a whole other half of the story, which, which we're still in the midst of, which is we don't, we don't know how to stop these diseases. And it, this book was written about 20 years after mad cow disease first hit Britain. It wasn't actually really noticed for a few years later, but we're now about 13 years after the book. And not much has actually happened. So I kind of want to check in with Dan to find out about uh, you know, what he's seen in the research and also check in with the people he spoke to as part of this discussion. It's a, I mean, that, that's that's kind of one side. I think that's why I think I, I like the book as, as a whole. I think it's also really fascinating and just is, a, a, is how he executed it, right? Because he's got some very difficult matters to tread here, right? He's got a family that has a disease and that suffered a lot through the disease, but also suffered from uh, the publicity that's happened. You know, they were basically harassed in their own community. And he's got two scientific characters who aren't terribly sympathetic, one of whom is a pedophile. And how do you write about that when someone so central to your character has such, you know, is so morally problematic? I really, I spent a lot of time reading the book trying to figure out how is he going to deal with this guy? So I, I, I've never read the book, but uh, I've read a lot of Max's articles in The New Yorker over the years, and I agree with you. He's a really fine writer and tells a good story. Are there any other scientific facts you'd like our audience to know, maybe about what prions are or mad cow disease, bovine spongiform encephalitis? So prions are really, they understanding, recognizing their existence is really a fundamental paradigm shift in our understanding of infectious agents. Uh, you know, since Pasteur, we assume that things that infect you have to be alive. They've got to have uh, DNA or at least RNA. And so they get inside you, they multiply, and they start causing havoc. And you can kill them by finding agents that kill living things. And it took a very long time for people to realize that prions weren't like this, that there was a whole different category of infectious agents. So it, it's in that way, it's kind of a classic scientific story of a real fundamental change in paradigm and how hard it is, reasonably, right, to get people to accept that because you don't want people dropping paradigms and it took painstaking work. So if I recall properly, the uh, proteins are produced from RNA and they're long and linear when they first are produced, but then they have to fold up. And of a confirmation. Yes. And, and one of the mysteries is exactly how nature comes up with proteins that unerringly fold into the right functional shape. Here we have ma- misfolded or malformed proteins, and somehow they're able to cause other proteins to then assume that uh, wrong shape and with eventually downstream health consequences. Yeah, that's just a, it's a remarkable kind of phenomenon, right? You bump into something in some complex way, and it kind of becomes you. I think that's something that people had a very hard time accepting, as much as that they were not 
you know, DNA RNA base. But yeah, the question was how it was transmitted, actually. Yeah, I think that there's this increasing understanding of that um, over time. But again, that's also just very basic research that doesn't quite tell you how you stop them. And that's something that, as Dan underscores in our talk, uh, uh, we haven't made a whole lot of progress on. And uh, as a general rule, maybe we should not eat uh, the brains of our own species nor feed the brains of another species to those creatures. Is that a good rule of thumb? You know, I, I remember being offered brain about 30 years ago in, uh, in Managua, and I think I turned it down then, and I think I'd probably turn it down now. Okay, very good. Well, uh, on to DT Max. I'm Corey Washington. And I'm Steve Shu. And our guest today is Daniel DT Max, staff writer for The New Yorker, author of The Family That Couldn't Sleep, which is our topic for today, and Every Ghost Story is a Love Story, a biography of David Foster Wallace, and also of numerous articles in The New Yorker that uh, I read whenever they come out. Welcome to Manifold, Dan. Thanks very much. It's a, Every Love Story is a Ghost Story. Oh, did I screw that up? I think you had it backwards, but maybe not. I mean, it's reversible, so it's true, but... Let's get a little background. How long have you been working at The New Yorker? And you can just, can you describe the types of pieces you write there? Yeah, I mean, I've been a New Yorker writer. I've been a staff writer probably for about 10 years now. And uh, before that, I did a very similar job at The New York Times Magazine. I mean, I've been a, a feature magazine writer for most of my professional life. I do different stuff. I've, I've been one of those people who just cannot stand to get cornered. And so... I've written about artists, I've written about scientists, I've written about science, I've written about oh, a cartoonist recently. Before that, I wrote a piece about Oprah Winfrey's book club. I'm just going back years here, back and forth. I write about Italy often. I did a piece recently about sort of the international, this is going to make it sound more boring than it was, but the international economics of the Chinese garment industry in Prado, Italy. So I don't know what you call that piece. It's kind of a labor piece in a way. Was it about fast fashion? It, it was actually. It was about it was about fast fashion and uh, about ways in which sort of the, the Chinese had really Prato had essentially become kind of a a Chinese city and about both culture and economics of that. Uh, and went along on a couple of police raids where they chased the Chinese workers who don't have proper papers and and that, and that kind of thing. So I do different different stuff. And in fact, you look at the two books. So The Family That Couldn't Sleep is a science book. What in England is called, I think without meaning to be uh, dismissive, pop popular science. Here that has like a little bit of a undertone, but there that's just, it's just they call it a popular science book. And then uh, Every Love Story is a Ghost Story is a biography of the writer David Foster Wallace. Um, so you can see in there, there's no branding. You know, when I describe your writing, I tell people you're a literary nonfiction writer. There's a well-known genre of literary fiction, people like Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Camus, Marquez, and then there's journalism and pop science. But your writing has a deep literary quality, and The Family That Couldn't Sleep reads a lot like a novel. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that it's true. And in fact, in the academic world now, uh, literary nonfiction is almost kind of an accepted category for instruction. But of course, it's very hard to say what exactly is literary nonfiction. Back in the 70s, nonfiction writers employed the techniques of novel writers to kind of invigorate the field in so-called new journalism. But the journalism tended not to be that accurate. I mean, they really, they, they, they went in much further than I would ever go in terms of using novelistic techniques. But the things that novels are interested in, which is character, change over time, uh, the telling detail, those are the things that have always been most, um, most exciting for me. And in the case of The Family Couldn't Sleep, so this is the book right about something called the prion disease. And I remember saying to my editor, when I first began writing about the subject, which I did initially for a New York Times uh, magazine article, I said, you know, at last I found a disease that has character. In other words, I never felt that I was somebody who's going to be able to write, you know, there's a book called uh, The Genome, I got it slightly wrong, The History of, of 
the history of, of genes in 23 and a half chapters. You know that book? Uh, I've heard of it. And it yeah. And anyways, the point is, it's Matt Ridley. I, I could not do that book. You know, I admired that book, but I needed, I needed a, I needed a, I needed a disease principle that was as weird and interesting as, say, viruses were seen to be, you know, a uh, hundred years ago. Like, I needed something that itself could be given a personality. And in fact, years ago, I wrote a piece about a marvelous chef named Grant Ackett who uh, has tongue cancer. It was a piece about how he. This is for the New Yorker. How he had, how he had elected not to have his tongue removed in order to maintain his ability to taste. And in that the original draft of that story, I made cancer a character, almost like a person, like searching for his weaknesses and finding occasions to grow and uh, and that kind of thing. I mean, toned it down in the end, but that's always been a, a, a kind of a prerequisite for me in writing a, a science piece. So you kind of answered two questions. I was planning to ask you, which was... Ask them, ask them anyway. <laughs> I know in the case of um, Every Love Story is a Ghost Story that there was a trial balloon article. You wrote a short piece for The New Yorker. Actually, I don't know if it was short. And then that later... Long, long. Yeah, then that later developed into the book. And I was wondering whether there was a similar... Uh, I don't know if you call it a trial balloon for the family that couldn't sleep. Yeah, it, does be, it did begin with an article. Uh, it began with an article in the New York Times magazine, and this is in the sort of early days of the web. I think it's 2001, uh, March of 2001. And even then, you could sort of see the, re the, the response. It's weird. Before the web, it was very, very hard to know whether an article you've written had gotten any response or not. Um, it took so long for the responses to get to the magazines and newspapers. But by... by 2001, you, you sort of could get a sense that something was interesting people. And of course, by the time I wrote the article on David Foster Wallace, uh, that was much even, I mean, considerably further along. But, you know, one reason you, you would do it this way was really financial, which is it costs a lot of money to do reporting. Uh, I mean, I'm not making a pitch here for donating to various nonprofit reporting institutions, but if I can, I would. Uh, it takes a lot of money. Like you, you had to send me to Italy, uh, for the, family that couldn't sleep. That wasn't really something I would have been able or inclined to do on my own. And then you get the professional editing. You get people who can tell you where the story is. It's not something every writer always knows. And I don't think I knew it exactly. I remember the beginnings of, uh, this will be your third question, but I'll answer it now. How did this story actually begin? So it begins this way. It's wonderfully humdrum, which is that the New York Times Magazine was doing an issue on diseases that cross borders. And I was considering going on the Hajj, because the Hajj is apparently a, a very high infection environment. All, all those people are, I mean, any environment where people are crammed together is going to have a lot of disease. And I don't remember why that didn't happen, but I, I, I typed into the internet, the web, maybe I used Alter Vista for all I know, you know, world's most terrifying disease or something. Nowadays, you really can't do that. There's too much on the web. Uh, you'd have to break, you know, you'd have to dig and dig and dig and dig. It doesn't work anymore. And, and a paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine came up, uh, about something called fatal familial insomnia. And that's actually how I first, first heard about it. Um, was just, you know, just by typing into the web. Again, I, I don't think that works anymore. I mean, I, you, you no longer, there's so much on the web now. You really have to have, you have to have the ability to sort material in a way that you didn't have to have in 2001. So at that moment, were you already aware of mad cow disease, and was it an accident that the thing you found was a prion-related disease? Or uh... yeah, it was, it, absolutely. I mean, I don't want to claim more more talent than I possess. I looked at it as 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 Corey points out. Like fundamentally, I have to relate things to to what is to what's most central to me, which is if you want to if you want to condemn me to literary nonfiction, I accept the sentence, but. But it's some sort of no, it's some sort of nonfiction that is more than the sum of its data. Let's put it that way. And uh, so in this case, you know, the title "Fatal Familial Insomnia" immediately, of course, makes you think of things that are very different from disease, you know, techniques or, or, or um, you know, it makes you think about families, right? I mean, right there. Now, that's just the happenstance of how they named it. As one of the people who named it said to me, he said, we could have called it familial fatal insomnia, but it didn't sound quite as good. I mean, they were even, they were aware even then that 
the naming of the disease would be useful in getting it publicity, frankly, or attention, because it's rare. I mean, it's it was rare when I wrote about it, and it's it, and, and, it, and it remains rare now. It was only later, uh, as I began researching, that its connection to mad cow disease became clear, and also the fact that you know prion research. Simply put, I mean, attracted the most interesting researchers in the world for a while. I mean, there's, there's just nothing like the story of Carlton Geidechek, who we could get to a little bit later. You know, I think I'd heard about a prion disease back when I was about eight, and I remember reading the, my favorite book at the time was the Guinness World Book of Records. Yeah, of And in 1974, uh, the rarest disease in the world was laughing sickness, and it arose through yeah. cannibalism. And sure. Crew, exactly, yeah. And that was, again, one of the... Uh, oh, so that's in the Guinness Book of World Records? Yep, 74 edition. It's back when they were big and fat, I, right? I, they, I, yeah, yeah. I have that book. Uh, yeah, so they're, they're fantastic. I, remember, remember Man with the World's Largest Mustache? Of course, of course. And being... And, a, got, and, and back then, the heaviest guy in the world was um, Robert Earl Hughes, who was 1,069 pounds. And he's about 700 pounds lighter than the most recent heaviest man in the world. And he was buried in a piano case. That's right. That we all you read the same book. The book <laughs> yeah. So you were at the time, this was your first science piece, is that right? No, I don't think that's quite true. I, I actually have to think about it. Um, it was certainly my first piece on prion disease. But I think I had done science pieces. And you also need to know that I myself had developed a rather nasty neurodegenerative disease shortly before. And so I was much more interested in disease than I would have been, I think, otherwise. I mean, I was, uh, I don't remember how old I was. Oh, I figured I was 40. Uh, and so I was in kind of, let's, I wouldn't say a morbid frame of mind, but I was very open to the question of disease uh, and trying to process, I think, for myself, whether I was, you know, uniquely afflicted or just sort of part of what we were on the road we were all on. I mean, the answer is obvious, but it's really how you emotionally experience that information. And so the last chapter, The Family Couldn't Sleep, is actually a little bit of biography. It's, it's a little memoir about my getting a diagnosis at, at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. But I didn't want, you know, everyone loves memoir, but I didn't want to get let people cheat and skip ahead. So I, I think that that's, that chapter is called A Note on the Author. Um, so that you, you would expect it would just be, you know, DT Max uh, lives in, you know, in New Jersey with his wife and two children, but it's actually a whole chapter. I remember you're hinting at it, at various parts in the book, um, and you do have the last chapter focused on it. Um, it's funny because right. you and I experience this book in slightly different ways. You know, you have a neurodegenerative disease, and I'm a chronic insomniac. And it's funny because I read some of your descriptions about how sleep naturally takes its course, and so if you're just eventually tired enough, you fall asleep. And that's not true for insomniacs. There's a separation between fatigue and sleepiness. Mm -hmm. And you get to the point where you can just be dead tired and your brain just won't fall asleep. Corey, I, I think for the audience, I, I would suggest that you explain what's in the book and what the disease is all about. Not, I think not everybody's read the book. That's right. So I'll leave it to Daniel to tell us a little bit about the disease. You're punting. Uh, okay, so, right, so I told you how it started. So what, this is what the book is. After that first happy foray into the internet, I called a neurologist in Chicago who tended to have interesting cases. So I asked him if he'd seen any interesting cases. And he told me he just had a, he just had a, a patient who had died from insomnia. And I told him that, you know, I thought that was impossible that nobody's ever died from lack of sleep. And he said, well, that's what you think. There is such a disease. I realize this is slightly inconsistent with the previous story, but they are both, they're both true. Uh, so then I said, I really want to come out to Chicago and meet with you. I mean, there's nobody as avid as a journalist who's seen a good story. And he said, wait, 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 wait. And my heart was sinking. I thought he'd tell me, you know, he couldn't. But he said, there's a family in Italy who have had this condition genetically for 200 years. And I said, well, where in Italy? 
and he said Venice. And immediately I thought, you know, death in Chicago, death in Venice. That sounds like something and, and went and got my passport. So what's the book about? Well, that is the book is about prion disease. So a prion is a weird infectious protein that behaves kind of like a virus. Uh, and so you can transmit a prion and cause prion disease uh, without any of the traditional uh, RNA or DNA substances, which we have always understood to be able to cause disease. This is a book which focuses on that Italian family and kind of covers them from 200 years ago to the present, uh, how they deal with the disease, how they learn about the disease, how it changes their lives, how it doesn't change their lives. And then finally, the book is really also about the way in which prions are relevant to all of us because, you know, the principle of the prion, which is a protein that misfolds and causes disease, is relevant in other conditions like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's conditions that are vastly more common uh, than prion diseases are. So, you know, it's in, 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 uh, in uh, England, the, the book is called The Family That Couldn't Sleep Unraveling a Medical Mystery. And I actually think that's sort of a better title because it really is a search. The book is a search. I search with the families that try to figure out what on earth is happening with them. And then I take you into the science and what's known about the science. And then finally, say these are things we might eventually learn from prion. Is it known in the case of this Italian family how the intergenerational transmission takes place? Are they passing the prions down to their kids, or is there a genetic condition that they're passing on? Which yeah, might... it's a single point. It's a genetic a point mutation, genetic point mutation. It's a very simple error in genetic in genetic code. And they're not the only family, but it's it's fairly rare. I mean, extremely rare. I think it's one in a million is the uh, genetic the incidence of the genetic mutation. So because of the mutation, their bodies tend to produce misfolded proteins? Is that how it yeah, works? Yeah, and there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's also an age component. So even if you have the gene, uh, you generally won't show any symptoms until mid-50s, 50, 55, 60. That's the typical age of onset. And I think the reason for that is probably just that the body does everything less well as you get older. Uh, and so you're producing proteins that are less exact, and you're also less good at clearing those proteins. Your body is less good at clearing deep one proteins, so the lysosome. So that's the probable reason that it's not as if the gene is only activated then. So, you know, there are a couple strands throughout your book. One is the story of this family, and then there's the scientific story, discovering and understanding the operation of primes. And then they kind of come together when you begin to uh, and maybe this is all when the after your book was published, when they begin to actually understand uh, the neurological effects of it. But I, I want to follow this strain of the family a little bit. And I have to say, I'm kind of amazed that you gained their trust and that they allowed you uh, such access. You you were allowed to read letters. You attended a family reunion. Um, what you said is a rather unusual thing in Italy because you need to disperse before you have reunions in a lot of Italian <laughs> families. Don't disperse, but the, but the family was, was very understandably very skeptical of allowing outsiders in. Yeah, I think it depended on who. So the, the kind of the the hero of the story uh, on the Italian side uh, was a doctor named Ignazio Reuter, who was married into the family, and Ignazio did an enormous amount of kind of after hours research. Uh, and in fact, he's named on the original paper with the neurologist, the original Fatal Familial Insomnia paper that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, the family was in a moment, I mean, I seem to have met with lots of families with genetic diseases, and I've, I've come to recognize things that I think are, more, are, are, are at least sort of typical. Uh, and I think one thing that's true is that uh, families go through periods of openness and then closure. Um, and, and the Italian family was in a period where they were very open and very, very hopeful. Those always, I think, go hand in hand. They uh, also were big admirers of the United States uh, and uh, our ability to solve problems. And in fact, that was true of everybody in the story, including there was an Italian neurologist named Pierluigi Gambetti, who's very prominent in the story and who's now the head of the National the U.S. National Prion Surveillance Center at Case Western. So Pierre Luigi was really the most important, or one of the two or three most important scientists in figuring out that they had a prion disease and what it was. 
anyway, Pierre Luigi told me a story about when he was a little boy in Italy and the American GIs came through throwing candy from their tanks. And I think candy from the tanks was something on some level that all the Italians remembered. I mean, it was part of the of the very positive image that the United States uh, had, and to some extent still has in in Italy. And you um, you you approach them through a contact, or is it kind of a cold call you did? Uh, I went through a neurologist. Maybe the fellow in Chicago actually may have been the first one who contacted the Italians, because you know. The world of people interested in fatal familial insomnia is pretty small. Uh, and, um, you know, I, so I speak Italian. I have, an uncle of mine was a screenwriter, lived in Italy and was a screenwriter, Cine Chita. Uh, and so I spoke Italian. So obviously that made a huge difference. Um, but I really think that, that, that what mattered most was just that they were just in this moment where they were hopeful. You know, they had made this discovery about what they had. Uh, and so, you know, they were interested in letting people know about fatal familial insomnia. I think in the hopes really of kind of starting a nonprofit or a fund. You know, this is before GoFundMe, right? But it was like the idea was like something like that would work for them, that getting the disease attention would help them to get the resources because these these diseases are so expensive to investigate. Um, and so that, that I think was probably the biggest the biggest thing of all. And then I think last, it's also true that, that Ignazio Reuter, who is the doctor who's married into the Italian family, uh, is a true humanist. I mean, he, I always thought of him as sort of being like the, the Erasmus of, uh, of, 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 the, of, the, of the Veneto. Like he really, he liked information, he liked stories, and he was supportive of it. And I think he, in a lot of ways, brought the family, the, the family along. Um, uh, you know, I, I certainly wasn't my. It was certainly wasn't my technical knowledge. God knows. I mean, I learned from. The, I learned from him. He really taught me about prion diseases. You know, I was actually kind of surprised when I heard that the family had given you uh, old letters um, written from. Oh, one- wonderful letters! Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, the, there's a there's a moment in the family couldn't sleep when the Americans are bombing uh, the docks near Venice, and I'm quoting from these letters that. Uh, this, the generation I was working with, their grandfather had been a, the fascist mayor of a little town. And he was taken, he had the bad luck to have a, a, a roaring prion disease at the same time as the Americans were bombing the hospital area. Uh, and it's an extraordinary letter. I mean, all the letters back and forth among the family members. You know, this is, this is near when phone calls were, were unreliable. But even during the breakdown of everything else in Italy, the mail appears to be, I mean, I don't know if the mail ever works in Italy, but it was working as well, as well then as ever. And so, and the family kept the letters and they, and, and they gave them to me and allowed me to quote from them. Are you still in touch with any members of the family? I haven't been for some years. So as I say, you know, families go through, I think, periods. Uh, and this didn't have anything to do with, with me. But at some point, the family... I think began to feel like the public exposure was not getting them what they had hoped for and was causing them a fair amount of emotional upset. Uh, and they, I think reasonably enough, decided to give it a rest. I think they decided they weren't going to carry the banner of FFI any, any longer. I, I wouldn't be surprised if a new generation rises up that, that will do it again. I just think at that moment, the, the courage it takes, you know, kind of comes and goes for a family. You'll see names of, of families in different diseases from time to time in the paper. And then you, you may notice those, those people aren't always the same, the same family that, that marches forward. If you take a disease like Huntington's disease or whatever. And you also should remember that when I wrote The Family Couldn't Sleep, I think there was an enormous amount of hope surrounding prion disease. And I think one thing that's been shown, and I think the family couldn't sleep, sort of predicts it and sort of doesn't, is that research has gone very slowly. And so this book was published in, is it 2006? Is that right? Yep. 2006. So I was, for the purposes of our podcast, looking through some of the more recent publications on prion diseases. And I remember that there was at least one researcher who back when I researched the book, which is around 2004, said, you know, in, in a decade, we'll have a cure. Uh, and then the Italians would laugh and they'd be like, oh, you know, a decade ago, they told me that. But the Italians are kind of cynical and worldly in general. 
the, the researchers, not the family. And of course, now I looked and I thought, you know, it's amazing how little has actually gone on, which is another way of saying how hard the research is. I mean, one of the things that the Family Couldn't Sleep tries to show you is how funding has changed uh, in the in the world of medicine. So there's, a, there's this guy I'd like to talk about more later named Carlton Gaidashek, who discovers Kuru. And it's actually incorrect, although it's in his obituary everywhere, that he, uh, that he found out what caused Kuru, which was mortuary cannibal, cannibal feasts, funereal mortuary feasts. He basically was funded by the U.S. government, you know, with a check. Whereas the later generations of prion researchers had to find, you know, what's very familiar to researchers today, I don't have to tell you, science researchers, you know, you have to fund your lab. You got to write your grant proposals, you know. And so his successor, so Carl Gadishek wins the Nobel Prize basically for his prion research, though it wasn't called that, in 19, I think it's 1976. And his successor, Stanley Prusner, also wins the Nobel Prize for his research in prion disease. But he does it partially with, you know, funding from private companies, grant proposals. I mean, you know, there should be there should be a Nobel Prize for getting grants. I mean, the, the amount of work his lab puts into the funding is just extraordinary compared to Carlton Gaidashek. So the book's also a tale of two, two science industries, two science cultures in the United States. Now they changed in 20 years. I think you say that in 2001, Prusner was the most highly funded researcher through NIH. To the sum of like, 50, did I say that? Like fifty million dollars. He's certainly he's gifted. He's not. He's certainly gifted uh, and good at it. And I think what's also um, one other thing he predicts, which I think t- came true, and it's in the book, is that I forget what year, but he's talking to a meeting of prion researchers, and it's kind of at the height of the mad cow concern because mad cow is a prion disease. And he says something like, you know, this is the largest number of prion researchers who will ever be gathered in a room. And everyone looks around kind of wondering, oh, what, is, you know, what does that mean? Will we all be in different rooms? You know, or, and no, what he means is funding has crested. Like, you know, this mad cow disease has, has because they wanted a test for cows, most of all. Um, I don't know how many of you are uh, listeners will remember what mad cow disease is or was, but this is a, this is a, a, a disease in the cattle in Europe, principally in England. Uh, in the 80s, uh, which causes cows to have s- aggressive symptoms like charging, charging their handlers, staggering as they go around, symptoms that a careful researcher could see have something in common with fatal familial insomnia and other prion diseases. Um, and after some very, very, very good veterinary research, it's traced to a decision uh, that uh, the British made a few years before to put rendered uh, cow protein into the feed given to the feed given to cows, and prion diseases are hard to transmit. It helps if the protein, if the receiving protein is similar to the infecting protein. So there's nothing more similar than a cannibalistic uh, cannibalistic meal. Uh, so. Um, now, when humans start eating mad cow disease, uh, you start eating cows infected with, with BSE, which is the bovine form of mad cow disease, a uh, uh, hundred and seventy or so get sick and die with appalling symptoms. And I, I mean, I don't know that there's again. I mean, your 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 capable listeners will will correct us both, but. To me, that 170 still remains on some level like the largest clearly delineated, you know, single innovation uh, food disease error, you know, committed in our lifetimes. I mean, I'm sure more people die from uh, salmonella poisoning every year, but but a specific change in something that results in such a catastrophic result is very, very unusual, right? I mean, you rarely, it's it's an unusually clear scientific uh, outcome. Um, but what's also interesting is that it was only 170 or so people, right? Uh, and I, in preference, in, uh, in uh, getting ready for our discussion, I looked up how many people had died since the book came out. 
and I don't remember exactly, but if there's 177 known causes, known human deaths from eating infected cattle, that's only about 10 or 15 more, I believe, maybe even less than when I wrote the book. So essentially, the number of deaths from mad cows stopped in humans, uh, even though the infection is widespread. Recent studies have shown that, you know, whatever, uh, that, that there are hundreds of thousands of people infected by prions. They did. They they take when people have their appendices out or appendixes out in um, England, they often do tests to see the presence of malformed prion proteins, uh, and they continue to do them and continue to find an astonishingly high rate of infection. But people aren't dying from the disease. You have a figure in the book where I think you say that the late eighties and nineties, uh, the British ate about six hundred and forty billion doses yeah. of. Uh, a BSE, and it's really kind of astonishing public health uh, mistake, right. right? They, uh, you know, they they were kind of nationalistic about it. They didn't want Americans involved. The bureaucracy is involved. They didn't want to harm the British agricultural industry, so they didn't right. want the information to get out. And the result, of, you know, I think you really say, you're kind of suggesting that one thing stopped this from being a massive catastrophe is this stuff is pretty hard to transmit. And even exactly. if it gets in your body. I was gonna ask I was gonna ask you guys, what's what's the most efficient foodborne illness? Anyone have any idea? I don't. E. coli. I, is E. coli does E. coli always get you sick if you consume it? I, I don't know. I'm just guessing, but uh, yeah. there are different strains of it also. Right. This may be so, a, our, this may be an example of the least you're trying to say, right? I'm just saying, you know, it's extraordinary. But, it, you know, what it also suggests, you know, and the family country tries to bring this out, is that we don't, there's a lot of things we don't know. So, for instance, the, a, a, a recent study of infectivity um, in, uh, in, in British people who, who had consumed doses of, of BSE completely reversed the previous one and showed that there's a sort of, there, there are people who have, uh, 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 polymorphisms at the at the relevant um, you know prion gene, and and it was shown that those who had valine at some spot on the gene had were far more likely to contract BSE than those who didn't. And the new study showed just the opposite. So now they're supposing that maybe it's possible that non-lethal presence of of uh, prion proteins in the in the appendix is a sign of one form of homozygosity. Anyway, the point being. We don't know. We really don't know a lot today. And I looked up some of the names who I'd been very familiar with in that time, whether they're still in the field, and most of them still are, uh, and most of them are still publishing. But I think it's just evidence that you know progress is 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 slow in this area, um, and that's obviously very bad news for the Italian family, and also bad news for the other families who who have the. Who have the condition? I, I I forget the books. What does it say about twenty families worldwide who have the inherited form of FFI? Is that too low? I think that's that's a little low, but yeah, but it's very it's quite it's quite rare. I mean, to the um, to the extent that one does actually understand uh, the genetics and the specific mutation that causes this, it seems like you could eradicate it all at once by just screening the babies or embryos of these families to make sure that it's just not passed on. Yeah, well, that brings us to the subject of an American couple who I wrote about in The New Yorker some years after this book was published. So book was published, um, and a few years later, I received an email from a guy named Eric Minical, who just told me the story that his, his wife, uh, his mother had died of FFI, and that she was positive. She had tested positive. I was kind of looking for... I was looking for different ways people respond to disease because that's in a way what the book is really about. And uh, I was intrigued by the fact that, that both Eric and his wife, uh, Sonia, quit their day jobs. She was a lawyer. Uh, he was, a, I think, an urban planner and began getting their PhDs in protein research, an extraordinary gesture. And they've got their PhDs now, actually. But the reason I bring it up now is that they had a child and they did embryo selection. So it is, it wasn't, I don't think in 2001 that was, a, a, sorry, 2006, I don't believe that was quite the option it is today. Yeah, that's very likely. I, I don't think that all the same, Steve, I, I don't think you're going to see the eradication of the, of the gene anytime, uh, anytime soon, partially because I think the, the, the level of education necessary to 
to do embryo selection, the cultural specifics for people willing to do embryo selection are quite narrow. Uh, I mean, I don't even know, you know, the member of the, of the Italian family did not have children at all, a form of embryo selection rather than, <laughs> but, but I didn't, you know, nobody would have accepted, I think, embryo selection among the more Catholic members of the family. Some were, some weren't. Yeah, you talk in the book about how uh, members of this family had a difficult time often getting married because word had gotten out that right. there's some disease. And this is pretty common in a lot of traditional societies. You know, families basically do due diligence on potential mates. Um, that's less common here. They don't even have to. I mean, they're, they're, even in, in Italy today, you know, people, this is something that's so different between the U.S. and and and, uh, and Europe is that people don't go that far from their homes. I mean, even if they work in Paris, they go back to their villages where their families are for the, for the, for the summer, you know? And that's also true in Italy. So like you wouldn't have to do due diligence. Everyone would have known the family and everyone would have known who are the cousins and who are the second cousins. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a very small town environment even today. And even though many of the more educated go into the cities, they still retain their, the relationship with their hometowns in a way that I don't think has any counterpart in the U S I mean, you know, uh, people really move in the U S I'm not saying they don't have relatives they leave behind, but they, they move. So, so I guess we haven't added that this disease is autosomal dominant, right? If, right. if, uh, if, if, if someone's a carrier, then should the children has a 50% chance of inheriting, uh, the disease. Correct. Right. Um, that's, that's correct. So, so let's take a, that's, Sorry, a uh, geeky question. What happens if you get two copies? <laughs> is it is it really bad? You die early? Does that is that known? Uh, that's a great question. I I remember asking that question, and I don't remember the answer. There there is a slow and a fast form of the disease, but that's not that has to do with your um again the hetero homozygosity question at the at the at the gene. Um, I don't I don't know, but if you think about it, what are the chances of getting two copies? Yeah, very rare, but uh, you know, maybe sometimes people marry their cousins in Italy. I don't know. I think they probably do, but but um, I just I, I don't know. I, I I think that 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 it's sufficient that the you know the the I'm, I'm, one of the unhappy parts of the disease is essentially 100 percent of those who carry the gene develop the disease. That's the other bad news. On a, on a slight tangent, uh, I was once involved in a study of a rare mutation which causes face blindness, so the inability to differentiate uh, other people's faces. And it runs in this family, and they said when they had family reunions, they would all wear name tags because they couldn't actually tell each other apart. <laughs> That's, uh, you know, there's a lot of people in my world claim they have face blindness, but I just think that they don't really, you know. It's a it's a continuous really, trait. They really, so they don't really care. You are. <laughs> it's it's a continuous trait. Some people are better than others. Uh, some are super yeah. recognizers. There are apparently people who can they meet somebody and then ten years later they pass them on the street and they can remember the face. Uh, yeah, at the, at the New York, we did an article about the the British have this squad of people who called super recognizers who uh, can match, I guess, video images with drawings I, I don't remember the exact details but but like the those dolphins in day of the dolphin who uh you know are able to intelligently communicate uh and are then turned to weaponized uses see now we don't need those people because the ais are so good at face recognition that's right and they're they're, they're they're on their they're on their way out with, there was a professor at my cashiers undergraduate college stanley rabinowitz uh who would every year he'd memorize the 400 people in the student facebook and uh, I was in my hometown about you know ten years ago, and I'm walking down the street, and uh, I see this guy, and he just starts staring at me, and he's like, um, he smiled at me. It was Rabinowitz. I hadn't been there in 25 years. Yeah, so he's an outlier of super ability. A kid that I knew since childhood, since I was probably five or six years old, didn't tell us until well after high school that he actually is face blind and didn't know who we were. Except he had to memorize, for example, the kinds of coats that we wore, and uh, so he he was kind of an oddball guy in high school. But now we understood why. Hmm. It seems a complicated talent to recognize the face. I mean, it's interesting that AI is now good enough at it. Yeah, because you know it's a. Uh, it just seems like one of those things that's much harder than it would at first appear. Um, anyway, that's not this particular family's. <laughs> 
problem. They they were quite good at recognizing each other. But anyway. So let's look at the science in the book. And as you say, you're pretty character driven, and your two central characters, uh, Carlton Gadjusek and Stanley Prusner, um, are, are complicated to say the least. I think at some point in time you quote a colleague who says that um, Gadjusek is an egoist and Prusner is an egotist. Right. But you know more deeply, uh, Gadjusek's a pedophile, and Prusner seems like a jerk. Um, and so you're writing this book and you're faced with the fact that these two people who could presumably, at least under other circumstances, might be heroes of your book, just aren't really suited to it. I think that's a very good observation. Uh, because I think in a funny way, The Family Couldn't Sleep is a book that's searching for a hero who hasn't yet appeared. And maybe to some extent, uh, Eric and Sonia, who I referred to uh, before, who, is, who are the American couple who quit their jobs, become pre armed researchers, are the heroes that the family that couldn't sleep doesn't have. So the hero of the family that couldn't sleep, I, w- I, w- I would say, is, is simply the human instinct to survive. But it, that's not quite the same thing as having somebody named Eric and someone named Sonia. Um, there were a number of difficulties in having two such unsympathetic star researchers. But for me, to be honest, they were, they were preferable to having more perfect people in that role. Because first of all, I mean, Carlton, so Carlton Gaidashek, who died a few years ago, right? Just to give a little background on him. Uh, I think he's the only Nobel laureate, at least in medicine, who later wound up in the county lockup. I could be wrong. People can fact check these kinds of things now very easily on their laptops but but it's at least true that he wound up in jail and he wound up in jail with one charge i don't know the technical charge but some charge basically molesting a minor because when he got so he he was a, a guy who grew up in in yonkers uh always wanted to be a great scientist stenciled the names of great scientists on the on the staircase up to his attic uh and when he saw that there was a group of Papua New Guineans who were dying mysteriously of something called the laughing disease, he saw an opportunity not to be missed. Uh, and he immediately convinced his minders at the uh, NIH to fund, basically with an open check, all the research he wanted to do in Papua New Guinea on, on, this, um, on this group of this tribe that was dying young. Um, so this coincided, these trips to the South Pacific coincided very nicely with his interest in underage boys. And he, he came to believe, I don't know with how much basis in fact, that there were man-boy love or man-boy sexual relation traditions on some of these islands. He comes back to the United States, I'll get to his science in a minute, but he comes back to the United States and he sets up uh, in suburban Maryland uh, right near the NIH office is a huge house full of young men. And it was a question even then in a more naive time, what did Carlton Geishek want with all these young men from, from, the, from uh, the South Seas, you know, from Micronesia and so on? Uh, he educated them. He sent them to Western schools and they would often go home to their countries that they came from and be major, you know, participants in the life of those cultures because they came with these with these blue chip American uh, uh, academic degrees, which were very, very valuable, and a cultural knowledge that many of their, many other people in their islands didn't have. Um, he molested some of them. There's, there's absolutely no question about that. And he was caught in the case of one, mostly because he kept these endless diaries. And I don't believe the diaries are explicit, but I, I was not able to read all the diaries. I read many of them. They're, 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 they're somewhere. You can read them. I can't remember if it was the Library of Congress or something like that. So, but what was, for me, was fascinating about Carlton. So anyway, Carlton went to jail. And then after he went to jail, he went to Europe. And I caught up with him in the Netherlands, where he was living in a kind of student hotel, uh, a residence, and enjoying life as a kind of highly esteemed Nobel laureate. So although his reputation had been destroyed in the United States, I think in Europe, there were still people who saw his talents and were interested in him. He was a big ideas guy. You know, I mean, he was, he, he would sit with him. I would sit with him. I mean, I spent a lot of time with Carlton. Uh, and he would, you know, sputter on about how all of, all of life evolved uh, 
conformational, uh, uh, you know, confirm, protein conformation was a model for life or things, things that, you know, he was a big picture guy. Like the idea that he could actually be funded today seems almost laughable. You know, I mean, he's so far from what you would fund. But so what's really interesting to me about Carlton is Carlton Geidischek, the one thing people know about Carlton Geidischek today, if anything, is that he discovered that Fora, that, that Kuru among this Papua New Guinea tribe called the Foray uh, was caused by mortuary cannibalistic feasts. So in other words, they would celebrate the deceased by eating choice parts of the deceased. Uh, and there was a protocol in terms of who got what. So, you know, the uncle got the arm, that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, that's wrong. As the book points out, and it's interesting how hard it is actually to change what people think is true, almost impossible. Like uh, the book points out very clearly, and I'm not the first one to point it out, that Shirley Lindenbaum, who was an anthropologist hired by the Australians, is actually the one who figured it out. So Carlton goes, and he was a maniac for bleeding, and he took like he, you know, he he took he took blood samples from thousands of foray, and he examined. He was looking for you know potential uh, potential um, contaminants in the wood smoke at, at their at you know at, at their um, at their fires uh, uh, in the water. You know, he did all the standard epidemiological things, and he knew that they practiced these mortuary feasts, but he never associated the one with the other. He may have thought the feasts were too infrequent, but a really, a really good researcher who was a little less full of himself uh, would have noticed that the people who were getting sick were the women and the children and would have looked at who, see, uh, protein was prestigious in the foray world, Papua New Guinea. And so the men got the best protein and the women and children got the, you know, mortuary. Uh, even then, I don't think eating your uncle was considered a, a really proud source of protein. So, so the reason women and children were dying predominantly of this disease was precisely because the vector was the funerals. And Shirley Linenbaum, who was an anthropologist, knew how to ask questions. Carlton never really was a good, I mean, I would sit with Carlton and I would feel like I wasn't even in the room, you know, again and again, he'd go on about, about, you know, uh, uh, about um, things that were abstract and interesting, but you know, there were theory stuff, really graduate student bull sessions. So that's Carlton. So Stanley Prusner, so, so Carl wins the Nobel Prize in 1976, and basically he's right. He basically says there are kinds of viruses, he calls them slow viruses, that can exist in the system for 20 years before causing damage, which would fit the, which would fit the, the uh, Kuru, you know, it would fit what, the, the sort of the case study for Kuru. Um, but he didn't actually recognize where the, where the infection came from. That was this other woman who did not get the Nobel Prize. Um, and if you look at the obituaries of Carlton, they still say that he figured out that cannibalism calls, caused Kuru, when in fact, he just spent a lot of American taxpayer dollars not figuring it out. So fast forward uh, 10, 15 years and Stanley Prusner comes on the scene. So, you know, when I say Carlton's an egoist, I sort of mean Carlton's a narcissist or was a narcissist. He really saw nobody but himself. And that's a very powerful theoretical scientific mind, but it's not a very good epidemiological scientific mind for obvious reasons. Stanley was sort of the, the reverse in that Stanley was proud the way people are proud who have achieved a lot and know it and know they're smart and have always been rewarded for it uh, and are good at playing the game. You know, he was just an egotist. He was just, well, you referred to him as a jerk, I think. You know, he didn't, he didn't, he was good at getting credit. He was good at doing the work. He was good at getting talented postdocs to work for him. He was good at, at publicizing prions and he named them. So prions before that were called slow viruses and he renamed them for proteinaceous infectious molecule. What, I forget what prion stands for exactly. It doesn't seem to quite work, but something very similar to that. And he knew he had a great term. And so, you know, imagine the, the nerve right, to name a disease principle before you even know what it is. I mean, what if, what if, what if researchers were always naming things different things just because they thought they were different? So um, You suggest, he, actually, he, Daniel, sorry, that uh, he named it Prion because it sort of sounded a little like Prusner. Oh, is that, I, I thought it was because it sounded space age. Uh, no, you know? It's in the book about... Yeah, yeah, I remember that. But I, but, I mean, in retrospect, I think, he, I think it sounded sexy because... You know, prion, look, 
in a lot of ways, biology wants to wants to be wants to be physics, right? Uh, and so, especially you know, the discoveries in physics are sexy compared to the discoveries in biology. And so, by making it sound like it was some sort of quark type discovery, I think he woke up a lot of a lot of journalists who would have otherwise kind of yawned at the idea that there was. I mean, if I tell you that there's a a protein that causes infections like a virus does, that may excite you too, but uh, or maybe not. But you know, it's not. It's one step shy of what excites the front page of the New York Times. You know, he was good at that. I, I'm not criticizing. It. I think that's a useful talent. In a way, the book be, means to be a parable about what what scientific talent was useful right after the war. You know, what scientific talent is useful now. But going back to your question about narrative, they couldn't really be the narrators for that reason. They they couldn't be the protagonist of the story. The prion really had to be the protagonist of the story, you know. Did you talk Mysterious. to Prusner? I talked to Prusner briefly and and obliquely and through cutouts and 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 there were some emails we exchanged. I never got his wholehearted love. He was he was just brutalized in a piece that had come out a couple of years before by the science writer Gary Taubes in Discover magazine. Uh, and he'd never recovered, I think, from the idea that that you know journalism can go both ways for you right? i don't think he expected it i mean it was, i wasn't going to brutalize him but i don't think he ever quite felt comfortable again with the odds being even so, so you traveled to italy you talked to gabby did you ever go to papua new guinea because a lot of the book I, takes place there yeah i didn't I, I i would have liked to have gone there um but uh in uh in, the substitution was I like I like to deal with written records a lot. There's no one left in Papua New Guinea, you know. I mean, what would you be looking at exactly except getting a sense of the landscape? And the world there is so different. But the original reports from the case officers under the Australian government are are also lodged at San Diego. One of those odd things somebody copied the entire case report from the colonial officers. And so I was able to get access to those reports and I used them. And I also interviewed the few people who were still alive from that, from these kind of crazy, I mean, it would make a terrific, you know, a Werner Herzog movie to have Carlton Geideshek going through the, the forest, the jungles of Papua New Guinea, like with a needle plugging everybody he could find and taking their blood before they could give consent. Whereas, you know, I don't think Stanley, Stanley Prusner as a movie is very difficult to imagine and requires a much higher level actor i think and a much higher level uh, director uh, i mean can you guys think of a single movie that makes um you know lab work sexy in the modern era the movie about uh, elizabeth holmes and theranos <laughs> just <Yeah>. kidding <laughs> yeah. for, all, for all the wrong reasons right right but i mean you know what i'm saying it's like it's like you walk into a, a i mean as a narrator you know that narrations of great importance are going on in labs, right? I mean, it's obvious. That's where the knowledge is being con constructed much so more so than in a, you know, whatever, out in the field, right? I mean, you know, Carl Gaidishek is completely obsolete today. He was a guy who would love to be out in the field. Uh, but it's very, very difficult to make any of that stuff getting harder, too, all the time, I think. I mean, look at the reporting on CRISPR. That's an interesting example. Um, and where that reporting is good and where that reporting is not so good. Because actually CRISPR comes up in connection with, I noticed in connection with prion disease and the possibility that you could, you could edit the prion gene. I mean, we don't really know what the, I noticed this also, we still don't really know what the prion gene does, which is interesting. Uh, we don't know what the prion protein does in the body. Yeah, I think uh, you said- There was some, one fat, so go on. I think yeah. you said at some point that I think they uh, deleted it in the mouse and didn't see any phenotype. I don't know if that's right. still true, but it's true. Yeah, but no, then, that, is, that is still true. That is, that, that, is, that is still true. What's happened since is that I think this idea of infections and prion has actually spread quite a lot more because there's some discussion as to whether Alzheimer's disease might have an infectious component. Yeah, I mean, there always was. There's a chapter in the book about why, you know, kind of a why you should care chapter since you're very unlikely to have a prion disease and you're lucky enough not to eat uh, beef in England during a, a, brief, a, a brief window in the 80s. So why do you have to care? Uh, and you're right. I mean, uh, there, there is, I, I think a certain amount of research has gone on that shows that there are other proteins, as they suspected, that behave rather like prions, which is to say that at least the sort of bare bone science of it would be that if one ma malformed pre protein touches an adjacent properly formed protein, it causes it to 
change form into the pernicious or, or uh, disease-causing form of the protein. And that seems to be, I mean, there's no doubt that amyloid plaques are, are, are uh, uh, embodiment of that principle. The question is, are they the disease? You know what I mean? Like, can you really refer to amyloid plaque as an infectious disease? It doesn't seem to quite work in that way. I did meet one person, uh, a veterinary researcher. One thing I loved about this book was it was just so weird. You know what I mean? I can't emphasize for you how, how much I like going down strange dead ends. Uh, and so a lot of the book, a portion of the book, is about how, how they might have diagnosed fatal familial insomnia with like the instruments and the tools and the understanding they had uh, when the earliest patient that the family identified, who was this doctor uh, in, in Padua, he may have had the disease. You know, I mean, it's, it's not a bad guess. But I spend a, a little bit of time also, for instance, on the British curates, the priests of their towns, who would notice the thing that we were going on with the sheep because scrapie is a prion disease in sheep. Similarly, I met a veterinarian, you know, not a super prominent veterinarian, somebody who's in the literature for prion disease. But as you guys know, like for every one researcher the world knows, there are hundreds of researchers doing even equally important work who just aren't in the paper, you know what I mean? And, and the people in their field know who they are. So there's this woman, and she had played a role when, when, when primates were a focus of prion research. And she claimed that she had successfully transmitted Alzheimer's from one monkey to another. Now, of course, they can't use monkeys anymore in any of these experiments, God knows. What year, what year was this? Uh, her name is Rosalind Ridley, I believe. I'd have to look up her name. It's Rosalind something. Um, you can dig her out of the... It's in the book. This is mentioned. Uh, but, you know, it's never been replicated if anyone tried to replicate it. You know, and, and probably nobody's tried to. You know what I mean? It's, it's just... It just flies in the face, and I don't, and I think probably it's discardable. But I found it interesting, and I found it interesting to meet a person who knew this uh, and felt that that she wasn't getting a hearing on it. You know, one of the people we just interviewed is Stuart Firestein. He's a professor of Columbia neuroscience, and Stuart's theory is that the way you should teach science is through narrative, rather than simply giving you know, classic experiments or results. You want to kind of present the mystery. Right, what something looked like at the time, and right. why people sort of believed a, a particular theory. I think actually the case of prion disease in your narrative is kind of a classic example of that, because at each stage you can really see why people might hold on to this particular wrong conception, and how it took it, was, it took a lot of effort actually to show that DNA or RNA were not involved. You could always find some way of suggesting it still was involved and un, undetected. Right. Huge amount of money too. Huge amount of money to prove. To, to come as close to proving that, you know, and I think we're all pretty satisfied with the proof at this point. But I mean, a huge amount of money just to, to check off that, that box. And then some of the old timers still don't, you know, believe it. There was a recent uh, study where I think they just used uh, genetically modified um, E. coli right. and they right. basically put in the malformed uh, gene and it pumped out the prion protein and then they injected that. And that's about as close right. as you can get to finding something that has clearly has was no that, RNA. The, I think the Ohio State, is that the Ohio State thing? I think it's, that's it's possible, yeah. Um, but yeah, but just back to the byways, like there's something that I, I enjoy uh, the failures too, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, in a way, Prusner, bless his soul, was the least interesting uh, character to me because he's a guy who, he's a guy who never quite missed, uh, but also in a way, never quite, you know, he, his joy was very, not muted, but very modern in the way that modern things are so hard to narrate, whereas Carlton Geideschek was really like a, a, like a, he was like a 19th century figure. I mean, he was a, he was a madman. I mean, he's just an absolutely insane uh, guy who's, you know, you could say that, that any successful scientist is the, is the sum of his or her un, you know, much like an artist of his or her un kind of un uh, uh, sublimated urges, and so we can argue that Stanley Prusner, and I'm making this up, you know, wanted to be famous in high in grade school because whatever, right? And when he and so he was driven by this desire to have glamorous women and a huge grant budget. That's probably true. But Carlton Geideschek, I mean, a man who who is so so clearly unable to sort out fact from fiction. He used to tell me, 
with great pleasure that he should be dead and I should be dead because we had passed, we, we, we had passed the age of child rearing or I had had children. And so we had served our genetic function. He used to tell other of researching friends that, that for his health, he had to have one orgasm a day. Not always one, but anyway, uh, by the time I met him, I, I believe he'd had a uh, prostate cancer. And I think he would, he had, that was no longer on the, no longer on the agenda. But, but um, anyway, my point is that he was, he was eminently narrable. I would love to see somebody narrate Prusner, but he, you know, he won't let you. That's the other thing, right? I mean, if he won't let you, it makes it, makes it even harder. I actually think one of the great distortions in science and in the reporting on science, not that you asked me, what is one of the great distortions in science and the reporting on science is that, you know, personality plays such a big role when personality you know, the ability to tell your science is what gets my attention. But that's not the same thing as getting good results or, or important results. I remember when I was looking for researchers to help me with the book, I would go into some labs and talk to people who, you know, whose English wasn't really very strong. And I couldn't figure out what they were saying. And so I would naturally gravitate to the one or two native speakers in the room. You know, a, a science lab today is so polyglot. Uh, and I would take their versions of events. So obviously I was in the process discarding other ideas, other, other theories, other, other focuses. And, and, and I was aware of it at the time, but you know, I just couldn't understand from some people what it was they were doing literally, but also not just on the level of the words, but also on the level of, you know, the kind of questions that a narrator, that a narrator asks. I think that what was wonderful about Carlton, I'm not sure I didn't sort of, I think Carlton was in some ways really a, a, an awful man. I think that that's important, and I'm, I'm not remotely trying to say he wasn't. I think he damaged a lot of young boys' lives, but that wasn't really exactly what uh, I was looking at, nor the other writers written on prion diseases. He, he energized the field, really. He carried it through this period when it really was nothing. You know what I mean? I mean, there was no, there was, it was just a scientific curiosity. It was just a few people, you know, it was a tribe. I mean, it wasn't. It was, it was just a curiosity, and, and his work was important for people like Prusner. I mean, Prusner, he, he disdained Gadishek, but, but there, would be no, there would have been no Prusner without him, for sure. It's funny, you have a, one quote I really like about Prusner. Um, you say, uh, describing his papers, uh, those papers don't make exciting reading. They're like postcards from a traveler who writes to you from every local train stop, extending little by little what he can say with confidence about the view out of the window. No, it sounds like it's quite different from Gaudrysek's uh, approach, which... Yeah, I, again, you know, not to, be, not to be a Marxist about it, but a lot of it does come down to the funding. I mean, Carlton only had to excite one guy, really, which was this guy, Carlton Gibbs, who funded him. Whereas, like, you know, I imagine that a lot of those papers from Stanley Prusner are, are papers where he's, he's showing the appropriateness of the grant he was given to do the research, right? I mean, he's got results. Like, he says, in this... We will use this money, you know, to try and purify PRP and prove, you know, that there's no X attached, you know. And then he's like, we have purified it and proven that there is no X attached. Like, well, he's like, well, now I need the next funding. That's something that Stuart Firestein actually emphasizes a lot. I think something that's part of our new kind of more modern understanding of science is just how driven it is by really mundane things like needing to get the next grant. I, I can't do science pieces anymore without that. I did a recent piece on a guy named um, Jim Simons and the uh, Institute for Computational Research, the Flatiron Institute that he's opened uh, in New York. And Jim is like maybe the 26th richest person on the planet. Uh, and he just funded it, just funded the thing. And you can see how relieved the researchers are that they don't have to apply for grant money. You know, it's the biggest, I don't know that, I don't know that there's that clear of advantage being there as opposed to say Princeton, except that you don't have to spend your time applying for grants. I'll say one other thing, even, even for that institute, the price of electronic subscriptions to journals is, is like, it gives them pause. The 26 richest man on the planet and he's like, you're paying what? And you're consulting it how many times? Do you know this guy, Steve? Yes, Jim Simons was a famous mathematician who did some mm -hmm. work in uh, uh, low-dimensional 
uh, I guess you want to say, well, anyway, he's, he's famous for something called the churn simons term that's actually used in physics. And right. But what's interesting about him, he was also a code breaker at the NSA. And then he yeah. actually started one of the early hedge funds, which was very quant focused. It's the single most successful hedge fund ever. It's called uh, Renaissance, and it's out on Long Island. So when he gave up um, running that fund, he basically got into science philanthropy and hence the Flatiron Institute. So, you know, grant funding has been an issue we've talked about. It just It's part of the granularity of science. It's an essential part of how science is done. I think people are now beginning to discuss it in a way that philosophers of science hadn't done because they weren't scientists and didn't have to get their grants funded the past hundred right. years. One last topic, Dan. I'd like to find out what your, what's been your experience since the book's gone away, right? Have you remained interested in this topic? Do you just let a topic like this go? Do you check the news periodically? Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's an interesting question because I think uh, what's kind of weird about hard science like this is, it t- is it's slow and it goes up against the human lifespan. So I'm still in touch with, especially with uh, Eric and Sonia, the Americans, with, she's the one who has the gene uh, and they become pre-researchers. So I keep up with them. Uh, I keep up with some of the researchers. I keep up with the food illness issue. I mean, the, the book was a, a very was very widely translated. It was translated, Femicons, it was translated in Asia. I don't think because there was any great interest in fatal fluid insomnia, but actually because of the chapters on mad cow disease. And so I'm, I remain very interested in the question of um, of uh, foodborne illness and why why what happened to BSC. So I just looked it up as it happens, and you know. There were no cows found in the United States with, 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 with mad cow disease for like 10 years, and then there was one three years ago and one last year. So when I wrote this book, uh, all the institutions that are now under consistent attack were, were pretty much above scrutiny. And it was the extremists of the sort of food purity movement who no matter what wouldn't believe that the USDA was testing enough cows. You know, the USDA has this weird double mission that it both is in charge of the business of agriculture and the safety of, of, uh, of, of uh, you know, agriculture. The same is true actually of the British, organiza- British uh, organization uh, uh, institute, as you point out, this huge conflict of interest. Yeah. So, so now we're in an era where think about how much less credulous people will be at any government finding. And I do wonder quite a lot if there were another mad cow outbreak, how people would respond if the government assured them that food was, was safe to eat, both in England and here. And so that's the kind of thing that still really interests me about, about this subject, you know, because the family couldn't sleep is really about, it, in a certain way, an unsolved question. Biggest unsolved question is like, why do we get sick, right? But the more, a lot of smaller unsolved questions, like why BSE isn't more infectious, right? Why didn't it kill all of, all of Britain? You know, why are, there's this extraordinary prion disease and yet it really doesn't matter to anybody in a practical, I, you know, when I go to my doctor, I always say, I often talk about the book, you know, to various doctors. And they go, oh, yeah, we spent a day on prion diseases in med school. Or we spent an afternoon on prion diseases in med school. And some of them have seen somebody who had like Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, which is another form of prion disease. And so I'm always interested in the extent to which like this, this thing has penetrated the, uh, penetrated the culture. And then, of course, as you say, like another way to look at the book is that it's a book about insomnia, right? Uh, not prion disease at all. And in that sense, I find sleep research extremely interesting, also very unsatisfying. One of the really great mysteries of life, right? There's this wonderful quote from, I think it's Alan Rechtenstaffen, if I have his name pronounced right, who says, if sleep doesn't fulfill any absolutely indispensable biological purpose, it's the greatest mistake that nature ever made. And I think about that all the time. You know, like we don't really have that yet. All you know, every so often, National Geographic does a cover like "The Science of Sleep Finally Explained," and I read it. And I'm like, no, the science of sleep has really not been explained. Yet. If I had to see which was explained first, sleep or, or prion disease, I'd say the more useful thing to learn about would be sleep. But again, basic research in sleep is very, very hard to find. You know, I think we are getting pretty close to it. The result that sleep seems to clean out. 
uh, these kinds of complex proteins, uh, tau and beta amyloid, in the interstitial mm-hmm. spaces. Like that's pretty important because as those build up, you begin to get symptoms of Alzheimer's, which is why, you know, we all feel like our IQ goes down as we're sleep deprived. <laughs> Right, and if that's right, that's fairly essential over time. But is that worth eight hours of lying inert in an open savanna? Yeah, because it becomes toxic, right? Uh, if yeah. you uh, allow it to go, you know, over a couple of days. Hmm. I mean, as someone who's experienced pretty serious insomnia, there's nothing worse than like not being able to sleep for a couple of days. You actually have to begin to downgrade the things you do. You know, I actually I can't write right very well, or I can write at a kind of overview level but I can't mm-hmm. actually begin to compose uh, really sentences that I'm really happy with. So I'll begin to do light editing and so forth. It's kind of a problem. You just... F- yeah, no, I agree with you. I mean, I think insomnia is the great undiagnosed disability. Like, my, my wife doesn't sleep well, and there's no question that it affects every aspect of one's quality of life. Yeah. It- you're, looking a little, you're looking a little tired there, Corey. <laughs> 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 I think I, I should go soon just because I see my children are returning... To the to the hut. Do we have more? Uh, no, I think we have covered we have what we need to uh, cover today. Thanks a lot, Dan. This was a pleasure.